On this podcast, we're tackling Iron Maiden's ninth. Thank you for joining us again for another edition. Nick Mars, the guitarist, he said, I fell out of the chair because I was so drunk. But let's delve into it a bit deeper, yeah? <laughs> Is that you quoting The Exorcist again? <laughs> yeah, and Dave must eat. <laughs> and there you go. That's the most interesting thing you're ever going to hear about Saxon. <laughs> Welcome to Moshtalgia, where two men look back at a music album released during their formative years as teenagers to 20-somethings growing up on Ireland's east coast. We will explore the album in detail and maybe reminisce a little as to what was going on in our young lives at the time. I think Irish radio misses a great personality DJ like you. I think they do. I, that's the truest thing you've said all day. This episode we go back to 1991 and we're going to revisit Metallica's Black Album. Mush. It was released on August 12th, 1991 by Electra Records. So we had finished secondary school just then that year, done our exams. We had to actually go into our school grounds and go and meet our headmaster and be told our results. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Metallica is commonly referred to as the Black Album. It's the fifth album they released and the follow-up to And Justice For All. Why was Andy called Black Andy? That's a good question. Andy was a burn and in Wicklow, burns are very commonplace. So to differentiate between the different burns, each of them has their own nickname. So you'd have the Robin, the Degs, the Black, the Bronskis, the Logger, the Dogshite <laughs> Burns, I believe, Bear Burns. And you can find all of these details on the Wikipedia, which we will not link to at the end of this program. I am. So Metallica was produced by Bob Rock and sold over 16 million copies in the United States. Bob Rock's the man. He was a man who launched many a hard rock album in the late 80s and early 90s. I think he came to Metallica's attention when they heard Motley Crue's Dr. Feelgood. Hey Nicky, I know that you'd never played on any of the preceding four albums, so how would you like to really play on this one? And he went, yeah. Is that true, is it? I don't know. You'd have to go to a well-known rock gossip website below the line. Yeah, fuck you, man. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. Nicky's great. No, you're a wanker. Metallica facts. Metallica facts. So the band deliberately made the song shorter on this album. They came to the decision after looking out at a sea of glazed over eyes and bored faces during their concerts. I remember getting off stage one night and playing Justice. And one of us saying, fuck. That's the last time we ever played that fucking song, said Kirk Hammett. And Metallica were also a bit lazy and realised playing long songs live was very hard. Facts. The first song actually written for the album was Enter Sandman in July 1990. I wanted to get more of the mental thing where this kid gets manipulated by what adults say. You know, when you wake up with that shit in your eye that's supposed to be put in there by the Sandman to make you dream. So the guy in the song tells the little kid that he kind of freaks out. He can't sleep after that and it works the opposite way. Instead of a soothing thing, the table's turned. In US fairy tales, the guy that leaves the sand and in the eyes. <laughs> At the time, it was a bit controversial to have Bob Brock produce as he was associated with the hair metal bands Bon Jovi and Motley Crue. But the band were really after the big fat low end he captured. Facts. Under orders from Bob Rock, this album was the first time they recorded all the basic tracks with the whole band live together in the studio. It was the first time they actually recorded the bass track as well. Which I suppose this is why Bob Rock was brought in because after James and Lars sitting together on the couch with cans that evening and they were listening to Motley <laughs> Crue's Dr. Feelgood they realised that compared to that tinny shit we just released yeah. oh, this is amazing Teleco! Facts. did you know Chris Isaac's Wicked Game was the inspiration for James Hetfield's vocal performance on The Unforgiven and Nothing Else Matters I did not Hetfield said uh, Bob no I've never really sang before I've always like yelled all the time before you know I was always going Facts. the listening party for the album was held at Madison Square Garden on August 3rd 1991 and 10,000 fans attended that would mean cool, wouldn't it? Quite a draw. Quite the draw. I have to talk about facts. Fact. Extricate another fact from inside you, Adrian. Here, here it comes. <laughs> Pull it out. Lars Ulrich, yeah. Kurt Hammett and bassist Jason Newstead were all going through divorces during the recording of the album. This inspired the working title of the album, Married to Metal. Really? Fact. The recording cost one million to make and took ten months, which included the album being remixed three times. Fact. With the more commercial sound of the Black Album, Metallica were accused of selling out their metal roots. 
The transition to corporate sellouts was confirmed by many in 2008 when a picture of Hetfield emerged in plaid shorts and flip flops, clutching an Armani shopping bag looking very on metal. Bargains imprisoning me. All that I see. Absolute savings. What a great deal. What a great find. Look at these jeans. Damn, it looks sexy as hell. Fact. When the Black Album went to number one in the US, Lara said, Um, you think one day some fucker's gonna tell you you have a number one record in America and the whole world will like ejaculate? I stood there in my hotel room and there was this fax that said, You're number one. And I was like, Um, well, well, okay, it was just another fucking fact from the office. What a miserable whore. He went on to prove that beyond doubt later. <laughs> he started the 90s as a bit of a miserable whore. He ended the 90s as a complete cunt. Facts. Bob Rock found Hetfield difficult during the recording, calling him Dr. No. <laughs> he found Hetfield close to his ideas and was constantly told no, 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 no. Absolutely right, because Bob Rock is saying, hey James, let's do a love song. Fuck you! No love! And Bob even told the band he would never produce for them again. And our friend Lars didn't even speak to him for a year after the recording. Mm. Fact. Now, despite being millionaires and selling millions of albums, Metallica sued the file sharing site Napster in 2000 for copyright infringement. But a and Music got there first. a and Music had a consortium of 18 record labels. What were their names again? What was all that about? Mr. A and Mr. M. Adrian and Michael. Come on. It was us, wasn't it? <laughs> I thought you were talking about the real... Uh, what do you mean the real? We are the real a and There's no oh, yeah, other a and yeah, There's yeah, only yeah, us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. James felt he could appeal to a larger audience with more introspective songs about his inner feelings. My Tell us how you misery. feel, James. Miserable lad. It's all about the well-being, you see. Oh, yeah. You're on about the doggin' again. You got the black doggin'. I bet James had the black dog a lot. Oh, he did. That black dog was a beast. And sometimes he took physical form as Lars Ulrich. <laughs> It just got a little too easy to keep writing lyrics like the Justice shit. He confessed to Classic Rock magazine. It's too easy to watch the news and write a fucking tune about what you saw. Writing shit from within is a lot harder than writing the political shit. But once it's out, it feels a lot easier to put your weight behind. Especially live. Uh, did he say that in a cod Irish accent? But live? Well, Hetfield, his roots, in fact, go back to Ireland in the potato famine. And I'll get to that a little bit later, if we have time. Did you put 50 pence in the electricity meter again, That's Adrian? I, I, I pay as you go. <laughs> I've run out of change. <laughs> so you pay after you're gone. Best way to get out of debt? Die. Speaking of debt, Metallica aren't in it because they had a number one album selling 16 million copies. Back in 1991. Exactly, Mondo. I have to talk about facts every single week. It's a fact. It is a fact. Fact. So, not being from the US, Lars, the Dane, like the rest of us, hadn't a clue who this Sandman was until James explained it to him. And did James explain it to him physically, like on the beach? <laughs> yeah. Um, this is the sand. Now close your eyes. And you know when you wake up in the morning, you feel like there's all rough stuff in your eyes? That means the Sandman has visited you during the night. Better be careful, because he's in your closet. He's under your bed. <laughs> Lars, you're the man. This is the sand. Come together. Sandman. Fact. Did you notice? Do I want to? The cover is not completely black. It features a coiled rattlesnake. Now this little fella comes from the Gadsden flag, a symbol of the American Revolution. Under the snake, it bears the words, don't tread on me. Words to live by. Absolutely. Fact. Dave Mustaine was one of the original members of Metallica. Mustaine would bring his dog to band practice, but it scratched then bassist Ron McGovney's car door one day. James Hetfield then got a bit angry and kicked Dave's dog, which led to the brawl, which resulted in Mustaine being ejected from the band. And the official reason was that he drank too much. I was watching the documentary, as I was saying to you before we started the podcast. Some kind of monster? To get me in the headspace for Metallica, I thought, especially the scene where Dave Mustaine comes in and speaks to Lars and says how bad he felt even to that day that he wasn't in Metallica. He'd be walking down the main street and somebody would go to him, yeah, Metallica rule, make it suck. I don't think Dave has done too badly in the last 35 years he with has. his own vehicle. You know, he's become God incarnate with his own band. If you have been following his press outbursts occasionally, you'll find out that he's, <laughs> he occasionally has a chip on his shoulder. Then he doesn't have it. I don't know if it's to do with whether his album has shifted a few units that week, whether he's in a good mood or a bad mood, or whichever band member can't suffer him any longer and has now left. I watched him on our main competitor show, uh, Joe Rogan, and he, he was pretty interesting. <laughs> I like Dave, I have to say. 
I know. I'd rather sit down with Dave than Lars. Oh, 100%. But imagine being in that band and then seeing, I think he describes it on the documentary that everything you guys touch turns to gold and everything I touch turns to shit. (laughs) Well, that's a bit disingenuous, isn't it? As you say, he's still touring. Megadeth had an album out last year. Not doing too bad for himself. No. Whenever you listen to this podcast, that'll be true whenever you do listen to it that Megadeth will have had an album (laughs) out last year. (laughs) Because they pump an awful amount of rubbish out these days. Of course, the two Daves are gone. Dave and his little Dave. Because he kicked out little Dave for showing his plum on the internet to some young one who recorded it and then tried to get some money out of the other Dave. Big Dave, (laughs) Senior Dave, didn't like that Junior Dave was, was doing it. So Senior Dave said, No! Oh, God. (laughs) Moshed out with Taylor and Bernie. I like it. So, do you want to go to the next segment? Yeah. The world is collapsing. Flummocations all around. That was the same year, wasn't it? Yeah. Same time and all. You remember that as well. You don't remember the real lyric. Do you remember that? (laughs) Flummocations everywhere. I can't hear the radio. Crying quote. Kerrang! 1,818 issues printed. An essential part of teenage weekends. Waking up at 11am, sitting on the bed, cornflakes everywhere, a Mars bar for dessert, flicking through the pages of this, at the time, only dedicated UK rock magazine. Reading about the latest Bitches Sin EP, feeling, as you did, deep twinges for Warlock's Doro Pesh, and just not comfortable seeing Ross the Boss from Man of War all lathered up in duck fat holding his plastic sword. Did you know that the term thrash metal was first coined in the music press by Kerrang! journalist Malcolm Dome? In the reference to the song by Anthrax, Metal Thrashing Mad. Prior to this, Metallica's James Hetfield referred to their sound as power metal, which was what Pantera would call themselves later. You know, Ooh. standing on the shoulders of giants and all that. Right, Phil? Yeah. There's nothing new under the sun. No. Mushkoja. Come 1990, the dawning of the new age of heavy metal chuggery was to be found in Kerrang! issue 311 on October 13th, 1990, headlined US thrash giants Metallica have ended their break from touring and recording to return to the studio to begin work on the long-awaited follow-up to their And Justice For All album. To move into a fresher musical perspective, the then-as-yet-untitled Metalla work finds the band breaking with longtime producer Fleming Rasmussen and taking on the 36-year-old Bon Jovi Motley Crue cult man Bob Rock. He produced a cult. Sonic Temple. That's one, yeah. 26-year-old Tubby Tub Thumper Lars Ulrich says the Canadian Bob convinced them that playing together has a certain magic than um, never happens with me doing drums on a click track. Um, James coming in and overdubbing rhythm guitars. It's taken me a bit of my um, surprise, actually. He continued to blather on relentlessly for the next 20 minutes. Yeah, but what's it going to sound like, Lars? We're letting um, the riffs speak for themselves for a change. Good man, Lars. No idea what you're saying. Time to get up to watch Football Focus on BBC One. A half year later, in April 1991, the hair is getting long at the back. I'm half studying for my end of secondary school school state exams in the bed again chewing on a bag of skips prawn cocktail it's Kerrang! issue 335 and it's the motor mouth metal militia man Lars Ulrich interviewed by the discordant drone of 32 year old Mick Wall who says the news that the mighty Metallica were going to be working on album number five with the hit factory producer Bob Rock sent more shockwaves through the world of metal than their previous four albums put together were the band about to sell out would the new LP yes. sound like Bon Jovi Is this the end of metal as we know it? James Hetfield is sitting in the next room, Studio One, guitar cradled on his lap, patiently laying down the ponderous melody that makes up the cyclical guitar part to a song that is called The Unforgiven. Is this your hysteria? I ask Lars, who slurps on a mayonnaise pickle roll. (laughs) It sure is, he answers. At that moment, James roars in through the talkback to tell us to shut the fuck up and that the smell of sour (laughs) pickles is as ugly as Lars' lips. Fearful as a widow's wail, stark as a new moon, there could be no other voice as James Hetfield's as Curiously, the second part of this interview would not be in the following week's issue. Rather, two weeks later, Lars was back spewing forth from his rictus. Strange. His rictus. <laughs> I like that word. Thirteen weeks later, in issue 350 in July 1991, I wipe my mouth in the bed and I read that San Francisco thrash stars Metallica released their latest album through Phonogram on August the 12th. Produced by Bob Rock and recorded in Los Angeles and Vancouver, Metallica frontman James Hetfield spoke to Kerrang! about the much-anticipated release. The song titles have been hanging around for a long time. It's just a question of finding subjects to fit them. Sound my true? Started out... <laughs> What the fuck was that? Finding something to fit them. 
sad but true. <laughs> that wall crawler's a menace. Sad but true started out as a schizophrenic kind of thing. The good and evil in everybody and how certain parts take you over at inopportune times. The god that failed is based on my Christian scientist upbringing about being alienated as a kid at school from other kids. Like we'd study health and I'd have a class on the body and I'd be taken out of the class because the Christian scientists couldn't look at tits. I did try to keep my mind clear of that. Uh, <clears throat> then it arrived in Kerrang! issue 352 on the 3rd of August 1991. Lars is on the cover. There's a single review of Enter Sandman and an interview with the mouthiest man in metal. The single review says Enter Sandman is the heaviest single since, well, since Metallica last got into the charts with one. Killer production from Bob Rock, a simplistic riff. The sleeve is heavily influenced by Spinal Tap's seminal Smell the Glove, i.e. it is very black indeed. They don't come much blacker than that, not even as Black Andy. <laughs> Those weird chords are really spooky, it says. In the interview, Lars opens up the clacker valve. James has um, got his ability to write things in a really indirect way. He leaves out half the words. Ha <laughs> ha! If you look at some of his sentences, there's so much air in there. With the topic of the Blacker Than Black cover of the new album, Lars says that initially they wanted to get away from the cartoony covers of metal bands in the 1980s. And he feels they've contributed to their fair share of cliched heavy metal. By the way, this article in Kerrang! is in pink text over a grey background, which is actually a photo of a pavement where Lars Ulrich sits spread-legged against a wall. It's painful to look at, painful to read. It's a bugger to read, I'd say. Yeah, especially decades later with our ageing eyes, Adrian. How are you doing avoiding the, uh, the optician? Not very well. You know, I have, a, I have a, like, a Garmin running watch and when I set the alarm for that, I, can't, I have to hold it like a metre away from my face to see the... <laughs> <laughs> it's disturbing. I don't know, I have to eat carrots or something. That work, yeah. That's, mm. that, mm. I don't know why I wasted money on glasses, but I could have eaten carrots. Just shit orange. <laughs> Lars goes on and on. Uh, too many bands become slaves to their mascots. Oh, dig at the maiden. Be having a go with Dave either. Vic Rattlehead. Vic Rattlehead, indeed. Still on the covers. More at the interviewer adds that people are bound to accuse Metallica of using black because it's a heavy metal album. He suggests to Lars maybe he should have gone for pink or something and avoid the whole Spinal Tap comparison. Lars just scowls in unusual silence and gives more at the finger. On to a different topic, and why not? Lars tells us, There was an incident down in Australia about two months ago. This kid at school walked into a class of 25 kids and took a sawn-off shotgun out of his bag and blew his head off. Um, it turns into this really huge thing because his favourite band was like Metallica. He lived and died on Metallica. And right away everyone at school was like, Oh, big bad Metallica. I saw the press clippings and stuff for the next couple of days and the principal at the school had banned anyone from listening to Metallica. Like, you know, be fucking real. Then, about five days later when they finally did do some researching into this kid's background, they realised that he had been sexually molested by his uncle since he was 10 years old. The next day, the word Metallica never came up again. It's a perfect example of people's one-sidedness. I have a question, Adrian. Do you think the uncle liked Metallica, though? No, he was into Judas Priest, I heard. Which brings me on to a story from our past. Do you remember <laughs> there was a conversation that Adrian throws his eyes Here to heaven? <laughs> Do you remember that you and I and our dear friend Robert, we had a conversation... I do remember Robert, yeah. Yeah, we had a conversation when we were about 13 years of age in my bedroom about getting a guitar oh, as a yeah. present. And can you remind the listener about what actually was the content of this conversation? The question was, would you let your uncle <laughs> buy you a guitar if he had sex with you? I think it was that, yeah. Would you let your uncle have sex with you if you got an electric guitar? Yeah. And Robert replied, you get an amp with it. As if to say that, well, that would definitely <laughs> qualify the situation and allow my uncle to bugger me. That, that'd be the, the game changer there, yeah. If you got the amp with it, yeah. Trousers would be straight down. And Robert had... Come on, violate me, uncle. Robert had many uncles. It was like Jody Foster on the pinball machine. <laughs> <laughs> but he got about a massive 100 watt Marshall amp out of it. If that had happened, would Robert then have somehow got a gun and come into school and sprayed everybody? No, I think he'd just he be at shot home. Them. He'd be at home playing riffs on his nice Marshall amp. <laughs> yes. He Sitting on a very, very soft cushion. Unless he listened to Metallica. Oh, could have drove him over the edge. I remember he had the Creeping Death 12-inch. Mm, and he used mm. to listen to it a lot. Oh. Wow. Mm -hmm. He'd come into the school going, I'm Creepy Death. Start shooting lads all over spot. Quote. Moving on. 
A week later, on August the 10th, 1991, it was here. In Kerrang! issue 353, the dawn of the new age of heavy metal chuggery. Back in Black states the headline, and a 5k review from Xavier Russell. After, and just as for all, Metallica, now remember with Xavier Russell, he put K in the place of every C written in anything that he ever wrote for Kerrang. What a twazuk. So, after, and just as for all, Metallica had reached their metal menopause. They'd outgrown their loathed frash tag, yet still needed to retain their hard edge. Enter one Bob Rock, a pretty producer who already had an impressive track record with bands like Motley Krell and Ancho. <laughs> but how would he fare with the likes of Metallica? I was worried sick when I first heard that he was going to be producing this album, thinking he was bound to wimp them out. I had a loaded gun pointed to my head, fearing the worst. But 65 minutes later, the gun is safely back in the holster, and I'm punching the air with joy because Metallica have come home with their most accessible album since Ride the Lightning. Bob Rock has done a grand job throughout, and for the first time you can actually hear Jason Newstead's bass. Even Lars Ulrich's normally tinny drum sound has been beefed up to cope with the powerful Metalla riffs. Musically, Metallica 5 leaves and justice for all on the scrap heap. The songs are a lot more thought-provoking and very personal. And we'll come to these tracks later, won't we, Adrian, on our track by track. That's up next. Yep, says Xavier. Metallica will sweep the polls this year with five. See you at Darlington. <laughs> In the following week's Kerrang! on August 24th, it's a pre-Donnington interview with Lars Ulrich. Metallica are second on the Donnington Monsters of Rock bill to headliners ACDC, with the Black Crows, Queensryche and Motley Crue supporting. All for the price of £22.50 sterling. Adjusted for inflation, that's 50 quid today for a one-day event. Just to compare, the current price of the three-day weekend download festival, which has replaced Donington, at the same location with standard camping, where you'll choose from 20 bands across six stages each day, you'll pay £264. So, getting my abacus out and putting my tongue between my teeth, that's £88 per day now, or £40 back in 1991. In your Leaving Cert results, Adrian, did you pass mathematics? <laughs> of course I did. You sure? One hundred and ten percent. These days, the main six bands are on the apex stage. So if we compare value for money, you're paying nearly double now for the likes of Metallica headlining supported by Disturbed, Placebo, Alexis on Fire, Simple Plan and Clutch, all the bands that you know well. One hundred and five percent. Anyway, Lars is backstage gobbing off as usual, and the little Dane is angry. Um, you see this deep purple abortion that the reunion has turned into? It makes me kind of sick, because it takes away from what it stood for originally. When you think of deep purple now, it's very difficult to think of made in Japan without thinking of the shit slaves and masters, right? When I see what they turned into in their 1991 version, it makes me puke. Now, I'm sure Ian Gillen would say this about Lars and Metallica five years later when they pinched off a load in 1996. Yep. Lars says he loves the 400-seat sweaty armpit gigs more than the empty Wembley Stadium atmosphere. The audience with their arms folded talking about gardening. So what type of show can we expect at Donington, Lars? Ah, uh, ha! A lot of daylight. Ah. Uh. They're delighted to support the headliners ACDC at this gig. The same ACDC that wouldn't let the Friday Rock Show record this 1991 concert. Bastards! No! Buy tickets! Be there! It's only 22.50! Come see the little man dressed as a boy with a broken mouth running around topless. What did they pay back in the day to go to the circus freak shows? Three groats. Tuppence halfpenny. Twelve weeks pass and we are near the end of the year. 1991. It's issue 367. There's a new Metallica single. The wholly unprecedented, totally acoustic number, The Unforgiven. Australian correspondent Murray Inglehart spoke to Jason Newstead and James Hetfield. Murray asks the best question ever of James and Jason. Do you ever do any moshing yourself? To which a 28-year-old James Hetfield answers, Not really, because too much shit can happen, especially in the Bay Area. I have too much at stake to afford to jam a finger or break an elbow. Hell, you might even lose an eye! Yeah! Hey Michael, let's Hi. go through this album, track by track. Track by track! Oh, I'm pumped. Starting with mm. track one. Yes. Enter Sandman. That's right. Enter Sandman needs no introduction. It is credited to Hetfield, Lars Ulrich and Kirk Hammett. 
There's an ominous guitar build up. Then Noose's bass starts joining in. And then you get a few shots of Hetfield's guitar. And then it hits you with the power of the drum sound when they kick in. I love that intro. Peels the eyeballs backwards, doesn't it? That's when it grabs you. You realise, Bob Rock. He knows what he's doing, yeah. Especially the thunderous riff when it comes in after the bass. And it just... Dun, 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 And the heaviness of it. The big raw end on it. There's not much to be said about it. It's probably one of the most famous guitar riffs of all time. An iconic intro. And then the visceral first sentence. Say your prayers, little one. Don't forget my son. Power. I remember playing that on the Friday Rock Show. Saying we've got some good shit tonight. Right. Well, you can't say we're not cranking out some good shit tonight. That was Metallica. And uh, Tony's just lined up the phone, so I'll be hearing someone's view on that single in a few minutes. Yes! There's a great guitar solo on here. Loads of wah pedal. The riff was composed by Kirk Hammett with help from Lars Ulrich, um, who suggested mm. that the first bar be played three times, which Kirk believes made it even more catchy. Bob Rock wanted Holier Than Thou as the first single, a fact the band remind him about this day. It wouldn't have got them any way near the chart success as they went on to get with Enter no. Sandman, that's for sure. Probably one of their best songs. Casey Kasem creamed the pants he did when he was introducing that on America's Top Ten. The bass vibrated through him in such a way mm -hmm. he lost control of his bowels. Yeah, he went raggy raggy roo. <laughs> This song got to number 16 on the US Billboard Hot 100 and number 5 on the UK Singles Chart on September 30th, 1991. Only got to number 16. Yep. The Casey Kasem couldn't have played it, could he? But he did the rest well, of the chart countdown, didn't he? He did, yeah, he yeah. would have done the Hot 100, but not on the America's Top 10 that we used to watch late at night on ITV. Yeah. Just before the hard divorces videos, which will come up I'll later. I'll never forget, that actually was on TV in 1991, and I remember that being on it. And Garth Brooks being on it all year, like his album was at number one, it was really good. It bugs me to this day. How many years later? Many. The B-side of Enter Sandman was a cover of Queen's Stone Cold Crazy from their album Sheer Heart Attack. Now, you may or may not know this, but after the US invaded Iraq in 2003, this was one of the songs they played over and over in sessions designed to break the will of Saddam Hussein's supporters. Which one now? The US Stone Cold Crazy or Enter Sandman? <laughs> Enter Sandman. Uh <laughs> what do you see me walking down the street? Stone Cold Crazy! Oh, I give up, I give up! All Saddam Hussein's supporters will be taking off the towels and pulling on fedoras. <laughs> <laughs> we love Freddie Mercury! <laughs> You did it. Uh, the US military also played children's songs at these sessions, including sections from Barney the Dinosaur. <laughs> I'm your big purple friend. Oh, give us a hug. So Enter Sandman, anything to add? Just our own spin during the time when we heard it. It was part of the end of our childhood, really, because we finished yeah. our secondary school. Then we were going on to get refused entry into universities. Therefore, stay on the streets forever after. <laughs> We were off to Never Neverland. <laughs> we thought we'd get something out of life after school, but in fact, we got Narton. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> hey, is that the black dog, is it? The black dog is on my shoulders. <laughs> uh, well, okay, okay. okay so sorry, <laughs> let, you know, if, let me interrupt you there a little bit. Has it stopped you before? I know, it won't stop me ever after. <laughs> Tuesday, the 17th of September, 1991. Speaking of university, I'm just going to read you an extract of my diary. So, I go for an interview at Ballyfermot Senior College. Adrian, unfortunately, didn't get the chance. <laughs> <laughs> you think things turned out bad for you? I didn't even get the chance. I hand them my demo tape and sit down. A course coordinator and the technical tutor ask me questions. The tape plays my and Adrian's show demo as I sit laughing at my own work. <laughs> but confused at their questions, like, how does sound get from a cassette through to the speaker so as to be heard by you? Huh? Who gives a fuck? I looked blankly at them, seeing my future career ended before it ever began. Next question instantly followed, as I gnarled my fists. What would a side section of a vinyl record look like? The best I could offer was, I don't do open heart surgery on my tape recorder and I value my record. Oh, listen to CDs. They stared back at me. I exit the interview and college pissed off, but a nice young lady in tight cycle shorts momentarily cheers my mood. That evening, back at home, I watch Bottom with Rick Mayo. So apt. Was Rick Mayo at your house? <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on then. By the way, I can tell you now how sounds get transferred from a cassette. Too fucking late now, you have the chance. <laughs> track it, Adrian, track it! Track two, Sad But True. 
Credited to Hetfield and Ulrich. An intense, repetitive, chunky riff drives this mid-tempo rocker. Again, it's all about the heavy low end of smashing drums and rumbling bass. We spoke about Pantera recently wanting to enter the void of heaviness left by Metallica, but this is remarkably like something you would find on Vulgar Display of Power, in my opinion. Subsequently, as we said before, Pantera mm. went on to fully appreciate this album in all its glory, and not at the time they were snotty nosed punks like we could do better than that. Having listened to both albums, like Vulgar Display of Power and the Black Album, very recently, doesn't fit in with what Pantera said. I think they were heavily influenced by this. I think that they ape it on a lot of the tracks. That's something we might ask big silly Billy Philly. Mm. This is repetitive, catchy. There's a slow crunching riff. It was the fifth and last single to be released from the album and reached number 20 on the UK Top 40 Singles Chart. Another top 20 hit for Metallica. As slow and ponderous and monotonous as you can be, but ah, it sounds great. So you've a great one-two here to open the album. And then we go into track three, Holier Than Thou. Which starts off with the lyric, No more, the crap rolls out your mouth again. Haven't changed, your brain is still gelatin. A put-down song, directed at the virtuous among us, who like to look down from their moral high horse and have nothing better to do than gossip about and judge other people's lives. I would consider this more traditional Metallica. It's a bit trashy. Yeah, There's a bit, nice bit of an old groovy riff on it. Trashy stain on it, all right. Yeah. Yeah. More melodic, of course, and Bob Rock brings that sensibility, of course, the pop sensibility mm. into this album. And Holier Than Thou is still gnashing at the bit, much like Mutt Langer back in 1979 and Highway to Hell tried to cage Bon Scott's voice, almost neutered him. That raspy, raw, hard, loving, living bastard was yeah, a little bit anodyne. Sanitized it. And here. It's a little bit the same, I think. It must be very tricky to get that balance between a nice sound and the naturalness of it. Mm. I think you did that with Garage Flower. What? Top selling band. Are you saying that I took the smooth and made the rough? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did a good job. So much so that Kieran Brennan thought it was great. That was really good. What was that now? Actually, he said, get the f- fucking thing off of my stereo and then he proceeded to chase Mick Jordan around the kitchen with a knife really because Mick let the dogs out into the garden when he shouldn't have at about 2am in the morning took a lunge at him and then I remember puking into the toilet as Adrian Jordan stood over me going boiled onions big (laughs) shite and I vomited profusely into the bowl of Mr. Clannad I don't think this is going to make it into the edit anyway move on (laughs) okay so nothing to add on holier than thou some of the other albums that we've gone through on this Nostalgia, I've come in and said, oh yeah, I remember this, I remember that. This album is so sleekly done that each song sort of melds into the other. And when I listened to it earlier today, before we came on air to record this, that nothing really stands out anymore. It's a bit bland, maybe because what subsequently came along in heavy metal ripped it up a little bit. Pantera came, they got heavier and heavier. Slipknot then were influenced by them. Korn came along. A lot of bands went on in all different directions, maybe influenced certainly by this album yes and trying to get that perfect sound that Bob Rock had made for heavy metal that Andy Sneap took on board and he made wonderful albums that then influenced the likes of Mastodon but yeah it's a bit samey it's a bit samey and I haven't listened to it in a month and I would struggle now and just to recall some of the tracks in my head as, as to how they go. At the time when we listened to it, because can I hold your hand and take you back into the Halcyon days Please. of 1991? Yes, okay, yes, yes. okay, take come with me, come with me. Close your eyes. I'm coming with you now. Okay. Oh, we're flying through the air. Getting cold. Where are we going? <laughs> On Monday the 12th of August 1991, I go to St. George's Arcade in Dublin and I flog a U2 12-inch for Def Leppard's Hysteria on cassette and I get Metallica's Metallica on CD and I rage Mm -hmm. baldy. Now, that won't mean anything to anybody else and we don't need to really explain that. I just rage baldy. It made you feel good. Yeah. So Thursday the 15th of August 1991 was our judgment day. This is when we went to collect our exam results, as I said earlier. This is my diary entry. Into our village at 9am to hear all of the happenings. Adrian and I go down to our school. I tape all this on a tape recorder. Linda Jones comes bounding down the school stairs, very happy. Oh, as does Leo McGrainer. Did you pass? Three A's, three B's and a C. Say that again. Three A's. <laughs> all our erstwhile classmates of yore. We all pass our leaving exams. Secondary school is now done. We listen to Metallica twice. Now that's interesting that we all actually listen to the album together. Doesn't say where we listen to it, but we listen to it. Second time with Finney, Linda and Mick Plunkett. 
Linda and Mick are cavorting like lovers and Finny is disgusted. Mick Plunkett is spotted to have a barbarous neck, as Adrian notices. Tell the listener, what is a barbarous neck? I think he would have a hickey, a love bite. Yeah, he too had been listening to Hysteria. <laughs> love bites, lovely. Linda's getting on her knees. We go out at night, we all get pissed, and we end up in Leo McGrainer's house. And we listen to Metallica again. Yeah! Mushkosia. It's meshed. Metallica and our end of school days. Oh. Yeah. We move on to track number four, The Unforgiven. It's a melancholy classic with acoustic guitar opening. This subverts the formula for hard rock ballads with a heavy verse and a soft chorus. Did you notice that? One of my favourites from this album. It was also the second single. It reached number 15 on the UK singles chart and number 35 on the US Billboard Hot 100. Answer me this then. What are you meant to do to a song like this? Are you meant to be getting off at somebody? Having your first romantic date? Where is this song supposed to be in the background? I would say to? you should be self-flagellating. Really? You think masturbating and think you yeah, dub the no, no, unforgiven? No, no. no, flagellating yourself. Oh, sorry. Inflicting <laughs> harm. <laughs> Beating that, yourself. But that's what the Catholic Church... Thorny stick. What? <laughs> this song is about James Hetfield's childhood dealing with his parents and being brought up in the Christian science religion. The young boy learns their rules, refers to Christian science. These religious beliefs didn't stop his mother passing away as he sings about that later on God That Fails. So he rejects the religion and vows that never from this day his will they'll take away. The chorus itself has the line, won't see what might have been. And this might refer to a future he may have got with his mother had she got the proper medical help. The Unforgiven may be the members of the Christian science and he's prepared to die always with the regret of what happened and maybe what he could have done to change matters. Which makes the song resonate a lot deeper yeah. than you would initially think. And it also contains an intro with a horn on it. <laughs> <laughs> really? This is from the Unforgiven movie, the Western, except it's played backwards, so you might not recognise it. So the film with Morgan Freeman and Gene Hackman. Mm-hmm. But he wants to go back and shoot all those Christian scientists. Pew, pew, pew. Yeah, I'd like pew. to see. I'd like <laughs> with Colt forty fives bouncing off rocks. <laughs> yeah, no, ricochet sound. <laughs> That's what sold the album, that, that it actually did come from a heartfelt place. I concur. Excellent. So with that, we'll move on to Wherever I May Roam. James has now been thoroughly pissed off with family life. His mother's dead and he's gotten out of the place. <laughs> he's gone on his travels. The red polka dot bag on his shoulder with a stick. And then he sits on his camel with a sitar. And he's there horsing across the desert on <laughs> <laughs> It's him and Kirk. Kirk's on the back with the sitar. James is just like angry <laughs> with the massive kaftan yeah. on him. Yeah, this is another highlight of the album for me. There's a great wah-wah guitar solo on this one. They claim this song was about life on tour. Hence the lyric, The Road Becomes My Bride. All right, so which band did the road song better? Which is the best? Bon Jovi. Ah, Wanted Dead or Alive is the correct answer. Yes. Why did they think they could try to do this type of song for this album? And instead of having that 12-string acoustic that Richie does on Wanted Dead or Alive, wistful, (laughs) whiskey-soaked, I'm fucked up, I can't sleep, on the flight to the next place, these lads are on a camel with a sitar. Whereas uh, Bon Jovi's is more melancholy. This one is, yeah, getting out there and traveling the world. A sense yeah. of adventure. So the Jovi lads um, were jaded and the Metallica lads were motivated. Yeah, there's a freedom when you leave physical possessions behind and you become independent and more powerful because you're out there on the, on the road every night singing to thousands of people. That's borne out true in time because Bon Jovi lost half the lads on the road. They all ended up hating each other, having to take lots of time off. You know, say, what happened to leave the back door open? <laughs> Of the airplane. (laughs) (laughs) That's half the lads. Where's Richie gone? I know. Sucked out the back. (laughs) Where's Dave? Hair billowing (laughs) through the air as he falls (laughs) to the earth. (laughs) But these guys are still touring to this very day. And they're still pumping out new music. And they're still, well, mostly the same band members. Or the nexus of Ulrich and Hetfield. The trio. This one reached number 82 on the US Billboard charts, in case you were wondering, and peaked at number 25 on the UK singles chart. Are you a roamer, a wanderer, a nomad, a vagabond? I'm a vagabond. Extra bonus points for which band had that name in their title of an album? Gonna give me a clue? I am. <laughs> Is there any Irish out there tonight? Is there anybody who wants a bit of Irish in them tonight? Think of the vibe. Think of Smiley Bulger. Bro Shields. He's me. Tin Lizzie. 1973, Vagabonds of the Western World. 
See, you get educated on this show as well. Vagabonds of the Western World contains what famous track by Thin Lizzy, 1973, that Metallica went on to cover? Oh, whiskey in the jar. I see it all. Mostalgia. This is Mostalgia. Albums that we love. Albums that were very important to us when we were growing up. On tonight's Mostalgia, we're looking at Metallica, the Black Album, track six, Don't Tread On Me. This says to me, patriotism, kind of a marching tempo. And this song at the time got criticised for its jingoistic lyrics. Poor old Danish drummer Lars Ulrich had to look up the word jingoistic in a dictionary to see what it meant. God bless him. <laughs> yeah, in 2012, James Hetfield, he told the Village Voice that, I love the song, but it shocked a lot of people because everyone thought it was pro-war when they thought we were anti-war. And all we're doing is writing songs. We're not standing politically on any side. Don't Tread On Me was just one of those Don't Fuck With Us songs and obviously referencing the flag and the snake and what it meant. And that all the tied into the black album and the snake icon on the black cover. Come on, guys, are you fucking stupid or what? Excellent. Don't mess with the Americans. Or should I say, in my best Tommy Vance, basically, don't mess with the Yanks. Like the rattlesnake, they don't attack until trodden upon. Once you mess with America, you will feel its venomous fangs. Saddam Hussein certainly did around the time which this album was recorded. Yeah, you just wonder the way that the zeitgeist of the world works, if there's a major war or there's some type of economic collapse, that does it influence the music that comes thereafter, that the next generation so, yeah. of young warblers yeah. and writers are all heavily influenced by what's around them and it kind of seeps into the music. A great time. The Americans were high on, on the 1990 Gulf War after going in there and kicking some ass. And this is the soundtrack to it. <laughs> By track. track number seven, Through the Never. I can't this is an angry even trasher. With a big driving, chugging riff on it. It's really fast. <laughs> <laughs> mm, you're very descriptive today, Adrian. All right. It's a fast one. I'll say. Kind of like something that might have appeared on Master of Puppets, perhaps? Back to the front, through the never. Twins. Twisting, turning. Your man James explained, through the never, was about exploring man's mind and how limited we are. You know, we try to understand the universe and what the meaning of life is, but mankind is just a mere blink in the cosmic time scale. Oh, you mean <laughs> he's talking about the... <laughs> <coughs> Jesus, mind's nearly over. You mean he's talking about the Kardashian scale? That's the one. In fairness, James got it right when he didn't even think about using all of those highfalutin words and he just said, Do not never! Put yourself back into it there. So back at Leo's place, listen to the Metallica album. Yeah. Everybody's there. We're all having a few drinks. And we're listening to this song and we're fucking trashing. And we think, yeah, Metallica are back being hard again. And, and then we go to track eight. Nothing else matters. This is when those hickeys appeared on Mick Plunkett's neck and uh, the rest <laughs> this of us... is when Plunkett drops the hand. And this is when we had to leave the room. <laughs> and Soft, Plunkett's scuttery drop. eyes, you know, and oh. smell of... <laughs> <laughs> smell of really stale beer. I love you. The hand goes down underneath the belt. The touch of the soft belly underneath the palm of his hands as he goes down further. <laughs> Leo had to watch it. <laughs> yeah. Ah lads, skip this one, skip this one <gasps> Philip's coming No Love Talica died right here As we have a straight up love song Metallica are singing a love song This is when Phil Anselmo retched I was physically sick <laughs> All other 1980s hard rock ballad warblers Stood silent together in honour That Metallica closed the book Old the Wilson genre. sisters held hands and just disappeared into the darkness. Joe Elliott put his arm around Rick Savage and shed a tear. Tom Kiefer. They were in word. Tom Kiefer of your favourite band. You don't know what you got till it's gone. And it was gone. Yeah. The ballad gone. had been claimed. Legend has it, this was inspired by a phone call to James Hetfield's girlfriend at the time. The call made him feel close no matter how far. James's writing couldn't be much more from the heart. As long as there's trust, the belief in doing things your own way. Forget what anyone else thinks. Nothing else matters. So he was phoning his girlfriend singing this down to the line and there's Dave Mustaine in her bedroom. Well, I think I probably could have wrote this at the time as well because I'd have been on the phone to Michelle. Oh yes, because the previously mentioned Leo McGrainer, you, I think, asked him to ask Michelle, would she like to go with you? 
But out in the Skip in this track Clouseau's club As we called Loose Holes Leo was there You weren't And he asked Michelle Not for you He, he forgot that And he asked for him And during A slow song by Maybe Bon Jovi Or Def Leppard It was probably on, on the dance floor <laughs> He stuck the big Freckled tongue in her Listen, fair play to him. I probably would have done the same thing now. It was a lesson hard learned, but I've learned that in this life, you got to take what you can get. There was a quote actually from one of our newsletters back around that time in 1991 that comes from a man called Lee Armstrong. He gave us some inspired advice. He says, you lads are just coming out. You just go in. You see, you gave yourself to her, Adrian. You said, here, take me. I'm yours. That's why you fucked up. You gotta get them one, didn't you? I had a blonde one in a miniskirt in a bog in the nightclub and Linda appears. I was just showing her direction, says I. And she believes it. That last bit <laughs> about the love and relationship. You didn't get in there, Adrian. You were asking lads to get in there for you, and they got in instead of you. Nothing else matters. A simple ballad of simple sentiment, which touches you because it is sincere and hauntingly beautiful. On a broader scale, Metallica also relate this to their relationship with their fans. It was the third single from the album. It got number six on the UK singles chart and number 34 on the US Billboard Hot 100. That's a big discrepancy. Were the UK single buyers a bunch of sad sacks? UK love Metallica at Apple. All top 25s. <laughs> Track 9 of Wolf and Man. Yeah! This is a hard rock, radio friendly, mid paced, crunching riff rocker. More traditional heavy metal fare, basically telling the story of being a werewolf. This had a misheard lyric situation <laughs> for me because when it comes into the chorus and goes, Shape shift, nose to the wind, shape shift, feeding I've been. All I heard was, Shape shift, nose to the wind, shape shift, feeding I've been, move swerve, all senses clean. <laughs> <laughs> he's there, he's like me, he's a normal man and he, <laughs> then he changes shape into a wolf and he just goes It's a good, good, good old shit and then he bounds off hunting for stuff but he has to have the shit first <laughs> Okay, starting to talk shit now <laughs> So <laughs> Adrian, seek the wolf in thyself The wolf in me is not really hidden During the week, during the supermoon I was at the back garden howling <laughs> Wicklow wolf, <laughs> hair everywhere Nostalgia with Taylor and Bernie I love these guys. So, the god that failed. First time around I listened to this for this podcast, mm-hmm. I kind of got bored in the second part of this album. But would you believe today, this morning, when I listened to this album again, I like this song. Don't know why. Yeah, it does kind of lose it in the second half of the album. Bob Rock has made extra sugary Ben and Jerry's rock and like he's piled every flavour that he can think of into your gob. And by the second side of the vinyl, you're about to barf too sugary, too smooth, too gelatinous. I think it starts off, you've the great one too, Enter Sad Man Sad But True, Holier Than Thou is good, The Unforgiven is epic, Wherever I May Roam is good, then falls off a little bit, Nothing Else Matters, obviously classic, and A Wolf of Man, I like that as well, and The God That Fails, and it kind of drops again. And I think if they kept this as a 10 track album, it would be perfect. This one, I think, more concentrates on the mother's death. It also covers the fact that he feels alienated as a child, as were certain classes he could not attend at school, such as physical health. One of the highlights? I don't know if it's one of the highlights. It is a bit ponderous if you look at it musically. There is that just one repeating riff and it's a bit of a do no no do no no I see faith in your eyes, broken is the promised betrayal, the healing hand held back by the deepened nail. Follow the god that failed. That's a great lyric. Bitter. Twisted. What we like on this show. Now, speaking of bitter and twisted. My Friend of Misery, track 11. It was a sunny day today. I kind of enjoy this track listening to it making me lunch as I did. But I think that's the way it should be listened to on a sunny day. To keep the black dog away. It's a bit of a depressing song. Yeah, in my notes it says sad bass. <laughs> oh, it could have been the name of the song. So it's dark, mid-tempo, miserable, negative. It seems to be about a person whinging about the woes of the world and all his problems. The person doesn't realise there are people who care or are encouraging them to look at the positive things, but they prefer to wallow in their own misery. Moaning and being miserable. Well, that was the making of the album. That's what they said. It was a moaning, miserable time. <laughs> Judging by that documentary, it's always a moaning, miserable time when you're hanging around with Zalika. <laughs> That's I, going through therapy and yeah. shouting at each other. And, and therapists saying, I think I need to give you more therapy. You're not yet <laughs> cured. You're all yeah. still mental. Give me Please more give money. Please give me that uh, $50,000 a month. <laughs> Such a circus. The rock and roll life. Finally, the last track is The Struggle Within. Oh, now it ends on a high. See, you should have stripped those last two songs out and just slapped this on the end after nothing else matters. Boom, in you come. The Struggle Within. Your 
we're losing. It got close to perfection there. It comes with the cowboy thing that they took on board in the 90s and they all started to wear Stetsons and big boots like you used to do. <laughs> <laughs> what? There was a period of time that you had in your life that you were walking around in big boots like you were Texas Walker Ranger. I had these very large caterpillar boots, all right. You know, the yeah. one, those the ones you're thinking of to kind Possibly, of yeah. platform me. Give me an extra few inches. They did, yeah. A few more decibels as well as you walked around. Yeah, used to charge around in them with the trench coat on. <laughs> Much like Metallica boys did in the 90s when they became ultra commercially successful and they just went a bit mad. Whether you feel this is the greatest album of all time or the worst album of all time, the facts are it's sold 16 million copies, it has hit songs on it and it still sells a ton of albums every week to this day. Whether you think Metallica deserves its reputation as the definitive metal album, you probably have metal albums yourself that you like more but this is the one that gets the recognition it was the right time the right place and was commercially successful who would sit down with an album that's over now 30 years old and still listen to it all the way through and not check their phone or do something else not actually sit down as they used to do the albums that we're talking about, we actually all sat and listened to them. And what's extraordinary is that with this album, we all sat in Leo McGrainer's room and listened to it. Are you telling me albums are obsolete? What's the point in doing this podcast, huh? <laughs> We're bringing it back. <laughs> we're bringing back the love of listening to an album all the way through and discussing it at length. Mosh out with Taylor and Bernie. I like it. Mosh so that's it. Is it one of your favourite albums? Is it your favourite album? Is it even your favourite Metallica album? No. No and no. <laughs> that's all we need to know. So let's go to the Friday Rock Show. Yes. We leave the last few words to Tommy. <laughs> yes. You know Metallica, they don't just read a book and then write a song about it, Adrian. It more comes from within, as we've just discussed. Mm-hmm. So says Lars on the BBC Friday Rock Show on the 19th of July, 1991, as presenter Tommy Vance splices an interview with Lars and James among the first ever UK radio play of Enter Sandman on the BBC. Here so is a surface scraping of the nine plays that somehow still survive of the old Friday Rock Show on BBC Radio 1. Up to then, Metallica had been played 67 times on the show since Metal Militia was unleashed on the ears of us unwitting oi on the 23rd of December 1983 1983 that's like uh, millions of years ago a really manic track bet they can't do that for an hour challenges Tommy chuffing on his 11th Rothmans of the night eight years later in 1991 it wouldn't be too long before the Friday Rock Show would too be smoked off through the never by BBC Radio 1 controller Matthew Bannister in 1993 but lie back and enjoy it now Four minutes of when the Black Album took us Irish and Brit Islanders by storm in July 1991. All the way through to the Metallica UK and Ireland tour of autumn 1992. All right, not off. We may have a fast area. This is National Radio 1. My name is Tommy Vance and welcome to the Friday Rock Show from BBC Radio 1. Tommy Vance, the Friday launcher. Back in the UK, the record's astonishing. I mean, the, 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 you're unique in terms of sound. Cool. Well, we worked really hard on it, and uh, we're pretty pleased, actually. I'm, like, listening to it myself. <laughs> after it's all done, after nine months of hearing, you know, the stuff. <laughs> it's pure Metallica, though. Of course. I think we'd be incapable of doing anything else. <laughs> and the album title? Uh, ask Lars Metallica <laughs> <laughs> we'll stick with that yeah. this is the single Enter Sandman Lars James thank you are you pure Metallica can't wait to get hold of the album it even made that's Tommy's voice lower Enter Sandman that's how Here powerful it was night. with Alan Freeman absolutely stunning album it really is that's Metallica Holier Than Thou track from their new album which is called Metallica. Tonight, you will hear more of that. It's being released on Monday. They're, of course, on the Donington Bill as well. Before that, Metallica from their new album, which is brilliant. The track was Through the Never. They had on the track from each of the bands appearing at the Monsters of Rock Festival, Castle Donington, tomorrow. Shoot the Thrill by ACDC, Metallica, The Struggle Within. Primal Scream by Motley Crue, that is their next single. Queen's Reich, Silent Lucidity, Black Crows, Jealous Again. Should be a great day, enjoy every second of it. Sorry we're not broadcasting it or indeed recording it, that was completely out of our control. We'd like to, but we never got the okay. Play that rock and roll! 
Yeah. Okay, back to the music at number five, Metallica's Metallica. Additional production by Bob Rock. Metallica, Metallica the album, the track was called The God That Failed. In the album chart, heavy metal and rock album chart. Current single for Metallica, Wherever I Roam. Metallica on tour in the United Kingdom. 20 minutes now past 10 on 1FM. Their full tour itinerary is as follows. October 24th in London, Wembley Arena. 25th of October, London, Wembley Arena again. October 27th, Glasgow. October 28th at Whitley Bay. October 30th in Dublin. November the 1st, Sheffield. November the 3rd, Manchester. The 4th and 5th of November, Birmingham, NEC. In the centre of the stage, the stage that they have, they have an area which is called the Snake Pit. It's in the, well, virtually in the middle of the stage. And it's occupied. Very few people ever get into it. It's got to be the hottest ticket in rock. It's not a, you know, you just stand there and you're surrounded by the whole action. They've got some great ideas, Metallica. They're so on the case. In Dublin, a lady who lives in Dromore, County Down in Northern Ireland, that's Pauline Cull in a snake pit. I'm jealous. The greatest seat I think ever invented for a rock fan. I suppose even for an opera fan, it'd be nice if they were doing that sort of stuff. You people will be in the snake pit with Metallica in the United Kingdom. One of the gigs, of course, in Dublin, which is in error. Good luck. I'm jealous. Metallica, current single, Wherever I Roam. And all the names that I mentioned who are going to be in the snake pit with Metallica will be contacted by the record company. The record company will contact you and you'll be in the snake pit. And a Sandman by Metallica, one of the best records ever made. Great lyric, great words. How do you think of great words like that? I suppose it's talent. 25 minutes past 10, this is 1FM. <laughs> Great album. Stunning. Talent. Brilliant. I think this album was so successful and I would agree with, I think, what Lars said. It's because the songs were more introspective. The songs about themselves. There was no songs about aliens in Hangar 18, troopers racing across the battlefield or werewolves or any mad shit like that. It was more accessible. So for a man like myself, at the time, I wasn't really into Metallica. I remember listening to our friend Robert's 12-inch Creeping Dead, a bit heavy for me, and I liked the Harvester of Sorrow single. Then I felt like one of the lads then, a fully-fledged rocker, because I could listen to the Black Album. It was really accessible. And there I say it, poppy. A few catchy tunes on there, a few catchy choruses, and it was more accessible to a lad like me. During the late 80s, I would have been listening to Suicidal Tendencies and you would have been listening to Curiosity Kill the Cat. How did I know you were going to say Curiosity Kill the Cat? It's like, I'm psychic. It was a choice Curiosity between Pet Shop Boys and I just thought, well, I could say Go, go West. Go for the sad lads. <laughs> <laughs> like, no one's heard of. Jazzy pop. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. So Metallica, yeah, it did. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, well, yeah. Do you think Metallica are a bit boring? <laughs> That's going to say something controversial there. They're very safe. Like, you two take themselves very seriously. I think they should more take the piss out of themselves. It's mm. more relatable to me and you. There was an article written by Ian Winwood in The Telegraph, and he says the once great Metallica are now metal's most shameless money grabbers. After decades of earth-shaking creativity, the highest grossing metal band of all time are stuck on autopilot and charging more than ever. Oh, he's a bit angry about how much you have to pay to get into the snake pit. He didn't have Tommy to offer him free tickets to get in the middle there anymore. No. Despite a ritual thumbs up from a compliant and suspine rock press, at almost 80 minutes, the quartet's most recent album, 72 Seasons, is overlong, overwrought and deeply ordinary. Oh no, they're not as good as they were when they started. There's a skip on your Spotify playlist. You don't have to listen to it. What's stopping these guys if they want to keep making music into the 70s and 80s? It makes them feel relevant. There is, as this guy says, the security in the knowledge that younger bands can no longer rise to the status Metallica will enjoy for as long as they choose to exist. They can even take comfort that they at least tried to warn everyone that would listen to them that 21st century technology would in time poison the well for every rock act who hopes to join them at the summit of the world. This is what Ulrich says. If people grab songs from the internet, then don't buy the parent LP. It's going to be really tough for new artists to break through, Ulrich told Kerrang! magazine in 2000. And when record companies see that sales aren't going up, they'll withdraw their support. But as the drummer pointed to the future, idiots stared at his finger. Yeah, it's hard for these new bands to be heard. But it's also easier for bands to get their stuff out there. It's easier to record stuff in your own bedroom. Yeah. You don't even need a record label anymore. From you can writing it yeah. yourself. Yeah. There is that more punk sensibility towards everything these days, ironically. So it's like everything. The more it changes, the more it stays the same. 
That's a Tom Kiefer song by Cinderella. <laughs> Coming up next on Nostalgia. Who love that album? Love it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Nostalgia. Another episode gone. We look back and think about growing up the east coast of Ireland. Join us again for another rumination, more reminiscing next time on another great album. Hopefully it'll be Kylie and Tiffany special. Much like James Hetfield on this album, we too will vent our spleens and pour out our hearts, our raw, embarrassing moments of our youth. You know it's sad, but true. Hear me!